All right, good morning again. Acts chapter 28 this morning. Acts 28, uh, I expect, Lord willing, that we will finish the book of Acts proper next Sunday. That's a uh, cause for celebration. I need to go back and, and double check the count. I think it's been, it'll be 58 sermons by that point. Um, by the time we get to anniversary Sunday, though, uh, we're going to kind of do a recap on anniversary Sunday. I think that that will be uh, very good, especially as we consider 47 years of uh, gospel faithfulness for our church, and also look back at what the Lord has done and look to the future to what He might do, and we'll do a recap of the book of Acts at that point. Looking forward to that, but hopefully we'll finish the, the book itself next week. We're going to be in Acts 28 this morning, and we will pick up in verse 11. If you remember, Paul has just finished being shipwrecked on the island on the island of Malta, and uh, this is where we pick up in the account. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the form of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. When we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. Now, you look at a passage like this, and this is like, you're probably like, wait a minute, uh, we've been reading big chunks, that was only a few verses there of what's going on, really wanted to look at the heart of this, the next thing that happens in the book of Acts is going to be three days later, and it's the way that the book, at least the way that Luke, that Luke wrote it, ends, really want to focus in on what happens here, and I think the thing that we see in this, as you look at this, again, this is kind of like last week, there's really no teaching in this. Uh, Paul's not giving any speeches or anything like that. There are no sermons. We just got to look at these normal everyday occurrences in the life of a believer and ask this question. All right, what is going, what is going on here? How does this apply to us? Well, what we do is, is we look at the rest of Scripture and we pull principles from that and then we apply it to this situation that's here. And I think the thing that emerges from this, this very short passage here, is a very important thought for us. It's a very simple thought. And it goes along a little bit with what we talked about last week, but I think the thought is this, we serve an encouraging Savior. We serve an encouraging Savior. Now, I'm going to ask the Lord to help me as I preach, and if you would, ask Him to speak to you as you listen. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would fill me with your Spirit. You know my weakness here today. I pray that you would help my mind, uh, Lord, that you would... Uh, control my mouth, that you would use it for your glory, that Jesus would be magnified in this, that the saints would walk away exhorted and encouraged and built up. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would strengthen them, that they would see your love for them anew, that they would see your love for them again. And Lord, for anyone here who is not one of the brothers or sisters, someone who's not trusted Christ, I pray that they would see your good heart Lord, that they would come to faith in Christ as a result of the good news that's preached here today. Lord, I pray that you would use this for your glory in the building up of your body. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember, there's a massive storm that Paul and his uh, companions have gone through. They'd been at sea for almost two weeks, 276 people on this ship, and the ship ends up wrecking on the island of Malta. And while he was there, Paul's bitten by the snake. Uh, he shakes it off. He ends up not dying. Everybody thinks that he is a god by the time it's over with. He ends up healing the, the chief of the island. He heals his father. And we pick up here with them uh, having been on this island for three months, essentially waiting for all the winter storms to pass so that they can move on the journey to Rome. We saw God working His purpose in Paul's life last week, purposes that were there for the good of other people. God, we saw, has purposes behind every storm. Verse 10 tells us, right before the section that we read, that when they left, that these people basically gave them everything that they needed. They, they put things aboard the ship for them. 
I wonder if Paul ever convinced them that he wasn't a god. In, in three months, I wonder if he ever convinced them of that. But they, they send them off, and so here they are now on their, way to, on their way to Rome. On the ship, Luke mentions that this ship has twin figureheads. Think of these maybe carved uh, figureheads that would be at the, at the front of the ship. And he says that these are the, the two gods. And, and we know from history that these twin gods that the Romans thought that these represented the sons of Zeus. There was one of them, his name was Castor, the other one, his name was Pollux, and these were the patron gods of the sea. They were the ones who supposedly gave sailors safety as they traveled. I think there's a great irony here as Luke mentions this. They get on this ship with the, the twin gods of the sea on it, and they've just been brought safely through a massive storm by the true God. And then they get to the ship where there are two gods carved on the front of it that are supposed to provide safety. I can imagine Luke pointing it out to Paul as they got on the ship and snickering a little bit. Paul gives Luke a, a knowing look and kind of nods with a smile. This is just a little bit of a snapshot of what it's like for Christians to live in a pagan society. They're God's are everywhere, and, and Paul gets on a ship, and the irony is that their God is the one who had actually protected them. The true God is the one who had brought them and spared their life. Uh, you know, we don't know everything that goes on here. I think it's important to, to note, and I understand that Paul is a prisoner here, but the Paul doesn't pitch a fit or anything on uh, about this and, and doesn't object to it. I think that he's probably just uh, trying to uh, lay low and make friends with people who are on the ship and not immediately go to something like that. But in any case, the ship takes off from Malta and it begins heading over to Rome. The ship, I'm going to show you a map here, the ship ends up on Syracuse. This is Malta right here where they had shipwrecked. And it lands in Syracuse, which is right here on the island of Sicily, down at the kind of the bottom of the boot of Italy. They stay there for three days. Then they end up at Regium, which is right here. And they're at Regium a day. A wind strikes up and they're able to go on. And then they move from Regium in between Syracuse and, and Italy here. They move from here up to Puteoli, this port right here. Now the interesting thing about Puteoli is this is the main port for Rome. It's 140 miles from the city though. So anything that went to Rome would come to this port and it would be carried up there. Now I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit for you so you can see it a little better. This is where they landed Syracuse, Regium. They go up to Puteoli here and then the form of Apius is right here that we mentioned and 3N. So you're looking, um, you're looking at about 140 miles total away from there and they are going to head to Rome from there. Now here's, there's some interesting things that happen in this. Being 140 miles from Rome they stay there for seven days, and evidently, word spreads from there inland to the city of Rome that Paul has finally made it to Italy. But there's some remarkable freedom that Paul has here in this. Uh, for seven days, he's here. They find some brothers there, we, we see. And, and you almost get the idea that Julius, the centurion, is just letting Paul do his thing. He, he trusts him. God has sent him this kind centurion who's going to take care of him. But here we are on the cusp of God keeping his promise to Paul. The promise that Paul would make it to Rome. Now, what do we see as we look at this? As Paul uh, approaches the city, we see a lot of encouragement. We see a lot of things that should give us heart and hope. As Paul comes to Rome... Notice some of the things. Oh, I forgot to show you this. Uh, this is the road between uh, Puteoli and Rome. It is called the, uh, the Appian Way. This road is still in existence today. Uh, the Romans, y'all know this. The Romans built their roads very well. As a matter of fact, this road had been built probably 200 years before Paul walked on it. And all that time, it's still in existence today. There's some places that people still drive on it. But this is a picture of that. This is the road between Puteoli and Rome. And this is a road that Paul, in all likelihood, would have walked on on his journey to Rome. 
So there are several things that we see in this. As Paul comes to Rome, look at this. Look at the spread of the gospel. When you get to verse 11 through 14, particularly in verse 14 when they get to Puteoli, there we found brothers. Think about this. Jesus had kept His promise. All the way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, what was it that Jesus had told them? You will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was a long time ago. The march of the gospel was slow, but it was sure. It was unabated. It hadn't been stopped because you're looking at 25 to 30 years prior to this that Jesus had made that promise. But what had happened? Paul gets to Rome and there are believers who are waiting on him. Here in the Gentile capital city of the world is a Christian presence. But the other thing in this was that Jesus had used no names to plant this church. Paul loved this church. We don't know for sure who started it. It could have been Aquila and Priscilla. When you look at the end of the book of Romans in Acts chapter 16, Paul says, greet Aquila and Priscilla and the, the church that is in their house. It is possible that they are the ones who started it. And Paul had definitely had an influence on them. But when Paul gets here, the brothers and sisters are there. Paul had known them. He had loved them. He had written an entire book to them. And I'm not hitting on Paul here. I'm just saying that the gospel is bigger than any one man and bigger than any one church because guess what? This church had been started as the gospel had been carried on the wings of commerce and business. Believers were already here and Paul had already written to them a long time before this. He didn't start this church, but he sure loved it. Just look over one page probably in your Bible, Romans chapter 1. Paul writes to the people, and I want you to hear the affection that he has for them, people that he's never met, clearly a church that he didn't start. And this is what he says in verse 8, Romans 1, 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For my God, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. He got there, just not the way that he wanted. Verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. That is a very key verse. I want you to think about what he's... I want to be mutually encouraged. That's going to be fulfilled. That prayer of Paul's is going to be fulfilled here in a moment. Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you but this far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, as I am under obligation both to Greeks and to, bar to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I think it's interesting that Paul uses that phrase there, I'm eager to, pre eager to preach the gospel to you. These are believers. But he wants to preach the gospel to them. That's that brings back into relief or into clear understanding the fact that the gospel isn't just our entrance into Christianity. It's something that we live every day. It's something that we embrace every day. In the book of Romans, is Paul doing what to these believers? It's him preaching the gospel to those believers who are there. But make no mistake about this. The gospel is marching along. It can move along in a pagan society. If it can move along in that society... What keeps it from moving along in this nation and in the rest of our world? More than anything, the thing that hinders the gospel from moving along is a lack of surrendered servants. The gospel hasn't lost its power. The gospel still saves. Paul said it in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel hasn't changed. The thing that keeps it from spreading is a lack of surrendered servants. The reason it spread that far then was because there were believers who everywhere that they went, they willingly and gladly spoke of Christ and gave the gospel as they went. 
We must be people who live aligned with the greater mission of God, having hearts for the nations, sacrificing to send the gospel near and far. Surrendered ourselves to go when we are called. Surrendered ourselves to be used here and to be used there. But look, as you get to Rome here, look at the fact that the gospel has continued to spread. There's another thing that you see. Look at this church's heart for its servant. Paul is their servant. He says that over and over again. He is the one who is encouraging them and building them up. But as he lands at that port and he's there for seven days, he heads inland to Rome. And as he heads inland down that uh, Appian Way that we looked at, something interesting happens. He, he comes to this place, if you look at it there in verse 15, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the foreign, uh, forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. Now, this, foreign, uh, this forum of Appius is 40 miles away from the city of Rome. Just think about that for a moment in those ancient times. 40 miles was two days' journey. That, that would be like us hopping in a car, driving all day, spending the night in Mississippi, then driving the rest of the way to Texas to greet someone who's come back in the country. That is, that's not an, an easy thing. There's some sacrifice that's involved in this. Then he goes 10 miles further. This place, three taverns. There was a, It could also be called three inns. Both of these were, were stopping places along this uh, Appian Way. Uh, it, that they end up there. This is 10 miles further along, 30 miles from the city of Rome. And guess what? There's another welcoming committee for Paul. There's still, that is still a long journey from Rome. So what had happened? They had heard that Paul had arrived, and here are a bunch of people, most of them, who had never met him, but they loved him, and they came out to show that love and to support him. You know, this is really one of the main responsibilities and goals of Christian family. It's to encourage each other. And, and to, to do so in visible, tangible ways. Paul had written in Colossians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, I'm sending Tychicus to you. And, and I'm sending him specifically so that he can encourage your hearts. And this was something that Paul had always done. He was always the encourager. He was always the person who was thinking about other people and, and, and hoping that he could encourage their hearts. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Paul told them, I want you to encourage each other. Now the word encourage here, it, it is actually the same word that is used for the Holy Spirit. It is parakaleo. The, the verb form of it. it means to come alongside and, and to come alongside and to and help. To encourage is to inspire courage, to comfort, to urge on towards doing the right thing. Paul is, is, is showing us here, and God is showing us here, the importance of some Christian friends who will do that for you. And the importance of you being that Christian friend who will come alongside and help someone else. The importance of you letting someone come alongside you and help you to encourage you. Paul is the one who would over and over encourage believers, and now they are turning out in a major way to welcome him and to cheer on the one who had sacrificed so much for them. This is no small thing to, to travel two days to be there for Paul. Travel a day and a half to be there for Paul. To encourage someone who had sacrificed so much for the, for the gospel. And that's who we ought to be, church. Not, not just encouraging each other, but, but encouraging others who have sacrificed so much for the gospel. Uh, set it up this week, but the Davis family, our missionaries to Marseille, they're going to be here on August the 13th in our evening gathering. And they're going to be reporting about some of the things that are going on there in France. They've got a boatload of kids. And, and I'm just beginning to think of ways that we can encourage them 
and welcome them the way that these believers welcome Paul. Somebody who's put their family on the line, put so much on the line for the sake of the gospel. And, and I want you to be praying about ways that you can encourage them when they come to encourage them in this way. Are you, are, are, are you one of these Roman Christians? An encourager of the family? Willing to sacrifice to make that happen. Look at this church's heart for its servant. I want you to see something else, though. Look not just at this church's heart for its servant. Look at Jesus' heart for his servant. In verses 14 and 15, we see these brothers come. Verse 15, And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the form of Apius, or Appius, and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God. And what did he do then? He took courage. Just, just step back and think about this. It's been a long two plus years for Paul. Fake trials, delayed journey, shipwreck. He's in chains. He doesn't know what's next. He could get to Rome and, and, and Caesar could, could order him dead. God had only promised to get him to Rome. He hadn't told him what was happening after that. It has been a very difficult couple of years for Paul. And what does God do? What does Jesus do here? Well, Jesus, first of all, sends the right people. He has a welcoming committee on hand. I saw this, and this has a little extra meaning for me because I'm looking forward to this myself. It reminds me of a soldier coming home. And walking into the airport and the family being there, just a big party there with signs greeting him, welcome home, we love you. Can you imagine? Paul didn't know this was coming. He had no clue. Two plus years of this heartache and these trials and these delays and all of a sudden he comes upon this place in the middle of nowhere on the way to Rome and there's this group of Christians. It, they didn't have cardboard signs. They had them. Welcome, Paul. We love you, Paul. But Jesus is the one who had done this. He sends the right people with the right encouragement, just what Paul needed. I want you to, I want you to think about this. You remember in chapter 23, when, when Paul didn't know what was going to happen, and he, he's facing a, a trial, a sham trial, that could eventually lead to his death? And, and and Jesus comes beside him and stands next to him. You know what Jesus says in chapter 23, 11? Paul, take heart. Paul, take courage is what he's saying. Paul, be encouraged. And Jesus had stood beside Paul and told him to take courage there in 23, 11. But look at what he does here. Here Jesus sends Christian family to stand with him. And look at what Paul does. Paul takes courage. Paul is encouraged. A big shot in the arm. When, when it says courage here, when, when it talks about Paul, in verse 15, Paul thanked God and took courage. This word here has the idea of boldness. See, it's been a long process for Paul. He's battered. He's bruised. Paul is all creaky when he wakes up in the morning from having been stoned so many times and shipwrecked so many times. He, he, he's had this life of service to Christ and he bears the scars of serving Christ. He's heading into the unknown and when he gets to this place, there are Christians who are there to meet him. And I can see Paul as he sees them thanking God and Paul, who for two years has faced setback after setback, what seemed to be setback after setback, these believers come and I can see him standing just a little bit taller. His spine stiffening a little bit. As if that wasn't enough. <laughs> Ten miles later, here's another group. Paul stands a little taller. His spine stiffens just a little bit more. What a gracious gift from the Lord Jesus to a servant. It reminds me of what Jesus says. 
Mark chapter 10, he says, if you leave your family, your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, if you leave them behind, you will gain a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. What does Jesus mean when he says that? What Jesus means is what we see in verse 14. Paul says that when they got to this place, the brothers, the brothers, and that word's a general word that can mean brothers and sisters, the brethren, the brothers and sisters were there. See, Paul had family all over the world. He had picked up more than a hundredfold. He had left all to serve Christ, and here was family the brothers who were there for him. This is what the church should be. Yes, exhorting us, or exhorting someone when they're off track, but my goodness, even more so, we should be a group of cheerleaders for each other, arm in arm, family helping each other, day in and day out, not tearing each other down. And I, I've seen you do that the past few weeks. I just want to encourage you to, to keep doing that and to move even beyond. And it's good. I, I, I'm not minimizing this in any way. Uh, the, the taking care of and the food and the praying and that type thing. But in, in the, the, the hard parts of life, to be arm in arm with each other, day in and day out, progressing together, pulling each other along, holding each other up. As we go through a, uh, a world and a culture, honestly, that's slouching towards Gomorrah. quote the great judge Robert Bork. This means that we have to be people who overlook the annoying things that we do to each other and urge each other forward on our heavenly march. That's, that's, how, we, that's how we do this. This is, this is how we are like the believers. It can be like the believers here in Rome, yielded to and used by God. Jesus sent the right people with the right encouragement, and he sent them at the right time. I mean, it had been a long time since Paul had been with a church. It had been him and Luke and Aristarchus, and then a few believers that they had met, met along the way. But this, at the right time, Look at what God has done here. He's given Paul what he needs at the right moment. You can trust God for timely encouragement. He, he, he's heading into Rome, and this evidently is when Paul needed it most. You know, I heard a, a story recently of, of a believer. This person told me, I was at the hardest and darkest time of my life. They had just done something incredibly difficult with someone that they loved. And they crawled into their car and sat there and according to them were screaming at God. Why? Why are you letting this happen? What? Why me? God, have you forgotten me? What is going on here? And this person said that out of the blue, there was a knock on their car window. And it was a random fellow believer who had just happened to be passing by at that time, knocked on the car window, are you okay? And said right there, just weeping and praying together through the window, just holding each other through the window. <laughs> at the right time. That's the God that you serve. How many... How many of you have experienced that at the right time? But for that to happen, we have to be people who are willing to be used by God that way. To go out of our way. To help in that way. Why is it that God does this? The answer is simple. It's the gospel. He, he does this because He's for us. He does this because He loves us. We're His children. Jesus gives good things to those who serve Him. 
And sometimes we think that those good things, I could have used this a little bit earlier, Jesus, but he's never late. I think about, think about Lazarus dying. And his sister's being like, hey, Lord, if you've been here a couple of days ago, it would have been a lot better situation. And Jesus is, no, 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 no. I'm here so they can see the glory of the Father. So they can see my glory. He was, he was, not, he was not late. He was there. He does this because He loves us. He loves you, church. After the incarnation and everything that goes along with that. After the cross. And, and then we see something like this. The evidences that we see here in our own lives. How can we doubt His love? That is a love that He showers on His children who don't deserve it. And the good news here today is His children are the ones who put their faith in Jesus. They've trusted Him alone. And the good news is, is even if you're not part of the family, in other words, you haven't trusted Jesus, you can be part of that family. Your sin's forgiven. Not just... Not just your sins forgiven to where things are, are, you don't have to worry about hell, but real help in this world right now. Real hope in this world right now because you're reconciled to the Father and part of, part of the family. God does this because of the gospel. It wasn't our idea, it was His idea. He's the one who came to seek and save the lost. He's the one who came after broken human beings to restore them. He's the one who came after spiritually dead people to give them life. There's one final thing that we look at in this, and it's look at Jesus' heart for unbelievers. You're, you're probably saying, well, okay, I see the believers here and what they're doing. What do you mean, look at Jesus' heart for unbelievers? Well, don't miss verse 16. And when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Now, we know from other things that Paul says that he was chained probably to this, to this soldier. Chained to a table with the soldier standing there, and all likelihood, chained to the, the soldier himself. God brings Paul to Rome, and then what does he do? He positions him to spread the gospel into the heart of the Roman government. You can't make this up. Paul is a prisoner. He can't go anywhere. He's under house arrest. And what do we see happen from this? Well, he was trained to rotating guards. They weren't there all the time. I can imagine it. You know they heard the gospel. Paul loved a new guard. New guard comes in, chain. It's awkward for a little while. And the guard looks over at Paul and says, So what are you in for? <laughs> and Paul's like, I've got a story to tell you. You got a little bit of time? Of course you got a little bit of time. You're here for 12 hours. Uh, listen to this. And then he begins to tell. And, and this is what we read when you get to Philippians chapter 1. Paul says that my chains have furthered the gospel so that in the whole imperial guard, we think that's about 9,000 people, in the whole imperial, imperial guard, they all know that my bonds are for Christ. The toughest, hardest soldiers in the world at the time were being preached to regularly by this scrawny little Christian. Not only that, we see that Caesar's household is affected as well. You get to Philippians chapter 4, and he sends greetings. And as he sends those greetings, uh, greetings Philippians 4.22, he says that, uh, I send this greeting and those of Caesar's household. You know, you know what I see in this? You aren't where you are by accident. 
There is not a single person here today who is where they are by accident. I believe that some of these people came to trust Christ. Paul is God's man inside the, Ro the, the Roman government. He's a gospel mole. Just there, preaching to people. His best servant is in prison to get the gospel to the unbelievers that God loves. You aren't where you are by accident. You also aren't where you are to be silent. Paul isn't pouting here. He's blooming where he's planted. That is a, uh, a saying from a man named Francis de Sales from the late 16th century. It's been used by a lot of other people as well. He's blooming where he's playing. He's taking that situation. He's not, he's not mad about being bound like a criminal. That's what he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, here I am. He uses those words. I am bound like a criminal. But instead of being mad about it, he becomes a gospel force right from that house, right there is what would be considered his prison. The entire imperial guard knows. Caesar's house knows, uh, house knows. But in Philippians chapter 1, this is what Paul says, God's word isn't bound. We know of, for sure of at least one person who was saved from this. There were a lot more, but one, we know his name. His name is Onesiphorus. He, he writes in the book of Philemon, he writes to Philemon and says, In my chains, I've met this man, Onesiphorus, and he is my son in the faith. He has come to Christ. So somehow or another, this runaway slave meets Paul in his house, where he's under house arrest, and Paul leads him to Christ. But there's even more than that. He writes Philippians here. He writes Philemon. He writes Ephesians. He writes Colossians. He writes 2 Timothy from right there in that jail. We can't be people who let our circumstances dictate our witness. Dear brother or sister, get that chin up. Get that chin up. Your circumstances don't control your effectiveness for Christ. We've got good news in a culture that is full of bad news. Put yourself at the disposal of Jesus to be used wherever you are. And then watch what he does. Now, I was reading this week and read about a crazy find in the palace of the Caesars in Rome. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, we don't know that this man was led to Christ by Paul. They can't, they can't date it. They think that it might be first century, early second century. It's possible. It might not be. But this... It might not be Paul, but this shows this shows the effect that these believers had and the effect that Paul had because in Caesar's in the palace I was almost said Caesar's palace that's a place that we don't want to go uh, in the palace of Caesar's in Rome they found this carved on a wall. Now you're probably I, I'm I'm going to show you what this is in just a second. Okay, you can kind of see a vague outline here. There's a man. And there's something that's written right here. All right, Somebody went and took a piece of paper and scrubbed it, did, did a rubbing of it, and this is what it actually is. This, is. this is in the Palace of the Caesars. Today in Rome, this is what someone wrote about this, Today in Rome you can see a square of plaster cut from the wall of the barracks in the Palace of the Caesars. On it is scratched a human figure with a donkey's head. The figure is nailed to a cross, and a man is pictured kneeling before it. This artwork is an obvious insult to a Roman soldier who is converted to Christianity, for the picture bears the inscription, Anaximenos worships his God. There is someone in Caesar's palace who is a known Christian and evidently somebody, a fellow soldier or someone there, basically puts graffiti on the wall mocking him. They, uh, they're, they're mocking Jesus. You know, supposed God. Put a donkey head on him. But look at the impact of the gospel. 
right there in the heart of everything that was wicked and vile in the Roman government. Is this believer who's evidently living as a believer and it's known so much that he is mocked for it. Don't know again if Paul was connected to this, but we know that this type of thing happened simply because Paul was faithful to the gospel wherever he was. And then here's the final thing to consider in this. You are where you are to bring good news. Jesus has you where you are. Can, can I put it this way? And, and understand what I'm saying. Who does Jesus have you chained to? Who does He put in your life? That you're supposed to be the person who day in and day out, as you see them, is supposed to speak of the grace of God and the good news. Who, who has He brought into your life in that way. Lord, would you make it normal for us to talk about your grace and your work in our lives so that whoever it is that we're, that we're chained to, whatever circumstance that we're in, they're going to hear about Jesus from us in some shape, manner, or form. I think the final question that I would ask in this is not believer who has God chained you to, brought into your life in that way. But it's possible that there's someone here who has been, who has had a believer brought into their life to tell them of the good news. And the question I have with that is, what are, you, what are you doing with that? With that good news? Have you believed? Have you repented and, and turned from going your way and trying to, trying to earn your salvation to put your faith in Christ, in the work that He did for you on the cross? Because I tell you, if you are somebody who hasn't trusted Christ and there's a believer who's there pointing you to Christ, that person isn't there by accident. God's brought them along to you so that you can hear the good news. So, what, what, do, we, what do we walk away from this passage with, church? I think there are just a few simple things just to summarize this that help us think through this. First of all, live aligned with God's larger mission. We'll look at it again when we do the recap of Acts, but his larger mission is the gospel where you live, away from where you live, and to the ends of the earth. Be a part of that in every way that you can. Every day, Lord, how do I live in line with the mission that you've given us? I think the next thing is this. Be an encourager of the family. Be the person who'd be willing to drive two days to go encourage someone. Thank God for the encouragement that he sends. Don't pass over the fact that Paul, when he saw these people, it says he thanked God and he took courage. He knew where it came from. You know these people had accidentally and randomly decided to get together and go there. God had sent them and he thanked God for that. Don't let circumstances control gospel witness. Don't, don't let what's going on in your life and, and the fact that this doesn't seem like the right time, <laughs> don't let that control Jesus just being a normal part of your conversation. And I'd say the last thing is this. Don't ignore the good news that God has brought to you. In other words, if you've not trusted Christ, Call out to Him to save you. Trust His death for you in your place and His resurrection to give you eternal life. If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you haven't trusted Christ, I want to show you from the Scripture and, and talk about that. Let's, let's talk. Meet me afterwards. We'll dive deep into what that means. You can be forgiven and reconciled and restored to life. Believers, I'm going to just be silent here for a moment. I don't know how the Lord has spoken to you today. Hopefully it's to encourage you in some way or to challenge you to be 
someone who encourages, but whatever it is, I'm going to be silent here for just a moment, let you respond to the Lord as He's, as he's spoken to you. Lord, I feel like I just use this word so much today, but it, it's just all over this passage. Thank you for the good encouragement that we see here for Paul. It points to the way that you work in our life as well. We are so, we are so grateful for that. We are so blessed that you, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, would come alongside and encourage people like us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be to others what you have been to us. First of all, to our family in Christ, that we would be encouragers and comforters to them and exhorters of them. And then, Lord, that we would also be that to the unbelievers, to the lost who are in our lives. That we wouldn't, that we wouldn't miss the opportunities that you give us the day in and day out to make Christ known. Lord, it is, it is a mystery that you would love us. It is a mystery that you would forgive us, but we're grateful that you do. And so all we can do is sit back and praise you and thank you for the work that you do for us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.